Columbus, Georgia, this is your City Council. Mayor, Skip Henderson. City Manager, Isaiah Hughley. Pops Barnes, District 1. Glenn Davis, District 2. Bruce Huff, District 3. Valerie Thompson, District 4. Charmaine Crab, District 5. Gary Allen, Mayor Pro Tem and District 6. Mimi Woodson, District 7. Walker Garrett, District 8. Judy Thomas, Post 9 at Large Counselor. John House, Post 10 at Large Counselor. Sandra Davis, Clerk of Council and City Attorney Clifton Fay. Columbus, Georgia, this is your City Council. All right, well, good morning and welcome to the uh, April 14th City Council meeting. I guess it's the second council meeting under the new normal conditions, at least for the time being. Uh, all of our members of council, as well as our staff, are remoting in, uh, some from uh, from their homes and others from their offices. but. Uh, but we're glad that you could tune in to uh, continue to monitor the the uh, uh, the goings on of your government. Uh, and we want to thank again our our IT folks as well as Mike King for making sure that uh, you, the public, are able to continue to uh, observe how government flows, and so that we can continue to be transparent as we have always been, uh, in making sure that you understand what what what's going on within the city of Columbus. Uh, we will begin uh, as we begin all our meetings, whether in person or online, uh, by asking God's grace, presence, and blessings on these proceedings. Is Councillor Thompson available? Yes, sir. Councillor, if you would, please please uh, uh, bring us our morning prayer. Amen. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this hour asking for your blessings and father we ask for your help as we gather gather together this morning we pray for your guidance in the matters at hand and father we ask that you would clearly show us how to conduct our work with a spirit of joy and a spirit of excellence father god we pray now that you give us the desire to find ways to excel in our work in this city help us to work together and encourage each other in excellence Father God, we pray now for your continued leadership and your guidance during this pandemic. Father God, we pray now for your hand of comfort and deliverance. We ask that we will challenge each other to reach higher heights and, Father, to be the best that we can be. We pray for our mayor, Father God, our city manager. Father God, we pray for this council, and we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Oh, thank you, Counselor. Uh, last last uh, three weeks ago, it was a little awkward saying the pledge with no flag in the uh, screen. So at least being in the office, there is a flag behind me. If you would, Counselor, stand to your feet and we'll pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, United States of America. and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, under God. indivisible. Thank you. And because we are uh, accessing the meeting remotely, uh, I'm going to ask the clerk of council to call the roll so that we'll know uh, who who is in attendance. Madam Clerk. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Council. We will have roll call to record who is present. Mayor Pro Tem Allen. Here. Council Barnes. Here. Councilor Crabb. Here. Councilor Davis. Present. Councilor Garrett. Here. Councilor House. Here. Councilor Huff. Here. Councilor Thomas. Here. Councilor Thompson. Here. Mr. Mayor, we have 10 members of council present this morning. Very good, thank you, ma'am. Uh, first order of business, uh, I will uh, uh, ask for approval of the minutes. The minutes for the March 24th council meeting. We have a motion to approve. And Second. All right. 
uh, Madam Clerk, could you get the maker of the motion in a second? Yes, Councilor Thomas made the motion, seconded by Councilor Woodson. Okay, are there any, any uh, questions or discussion or edits in the minutes? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any objections to passing the minutes? All right, they're passed unanimously. Uh, very, very briefly, just want to give you an update on uh, the situation in Muskogee County in our region with regards to the COVID-19 virus. Uh, the governor extended his order uh, through April 30th, uh, and that was his shelter in place order. He also extended his uh, executive declaration of, of emergency through May uh, 13th. And that just continues his power and authorization to be or authority to be able to make any necessary changes to the orders he's already submitted. So, so the city of Columbus, as well as every other city in Georgia, is still underneath the governor's shelter-in-place requirements. Uh, again, the best site that we have found, other than the governor's website, to see the entire order, uh, is the Georgia Department of uh, Economic Development. At the top of their homepage, there is a uh, a tab for I, I can't remember exactly what it says, but I think it's it's COVID nineteen and its impact on business. Click on that, and it'll, you'll you'll see a wealth of resources. If you have any questions about your business or about another business that's in operation, um, the key uh, requirements of that of that order, though, are if any entity stays open, remains open to the public, there are some requirements that they have to fulfill. If they're a non-essential business, there's 21 of those requirements. If they are an essential uh, business, then uh, there are 16 requirements. Uh, here in Columbus, we've got 167 uh, positive uh, tests. Those numbers continue to trend up. The bulk of, of those numbers and the most massive jump were because of an extraordinary effort on behalf of Mercy Med uh, to do a, a lot of testing. They tested, I think, 12 or 1,300 people from the entire region uh, over a three or four day period. Uh, so we anticipated our, our recorded numbers of positives going up. The good thing about that was that they uh, identified a number of people who uh, didn't know they had the disease. They were asymptomatic. Uh, and because of the testing, we, they were able to establish some protocol where these folks were quarantined and they continued to monitor them with a daily phone call. Uh, the other thing I want to lift up Mercy Med for is they didn't just give us numbers and fade away into, you know, right off into the sunset. They also came up with a plan to alleviate some of the pressure on hospitals. They have offered up to every one of those that tested positive and had a, a little bit more of a severe uh, symptom uh, that they were dealing with, they offered them some uh, protocol to try to help uh, manage their symptoms so that they would not have to be be admitted. Um, now, our numbers continue to trend up, and I think we've already seen the uh, probably all of the tests that Mercy Med conducted uh, impact uh, our numbers. So that shows that we are still struggling with the shelter in place and following the guidance of the governor as well as the CDC and DPH. Uh, the fight is not over with this thing, and uh, and the the holder of the the key to getting through it is us. So I continue to ask you uh, in the public if you would commit to the social distancing, follow the governor's guidelines, uh, don't gather in groups of ten or more, no house parties, don't hang out at the lake on the dock and have cookouts. It's not a vacation. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to make a significant difference in the health and the financial uh, security of, of our community. Um, I'll tell you that we continue to monitor this. One of the questions that I get asked a lot is how much longer this will go on. If you've watched the press conferences from governors to presidents, uh, you know that they don't know. And even the experts, the medical experts and financial experts, don't know how long this will go on. I think the one thing, in my opinion, that is uh, likely to happen is that this is not going to be where we wave the checkered flag, say, we've run the race, we're done, let's get back to, to normal. I think there's going to be a new normal. I think uh, even as we begin to uh, encourage people to go out and shop local stores and, and get back into the, uh, the, the market, uh, there will still be uh, a social distancing requirement. 
Uh, and there will likely be some type of uh, significant encouragement from governments or, or medical personnel for us all to uh, make masks a fashion statement, to mask up. Uh, if we want to continue to see this uh, dissipate in our communities and in our states and around our country and even around the globe, uh, there's only one way to do it, and that is to limit contact and limit access to uh, to uh, the infectious germs of anybody who may have may have the disease. Um, we uh, we did. The city manager's been doing it, and, and I've got to brag on your staff, Council. Uh, let let you know just what an amazing job they are doing uh, under some very trying times. The government has been operating. Uh, I, I know there was some spirited discussion before the meeting this morning about uh, everything from government centers to uh, ice, uh, consolidating functions. I can tell you that one upside of of this uh, management uh, challenge that that. City Manager Hughley and his staff have, have encountered is that it has shown us another way for us to do business. So I have no doubt that our government will be just like our community. And at the end of this, we will actually be stronger, we'll be more streamlined, and we'll be more confident and competent in the way we try to address services for our citizens. Uh, we, sh we have shown that there's nothing that should get in the way from a technological standpoint to allow us to help our citizens access and, 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 and reach the, uh, the services they need. So it's going to be an interesting day as we start to kind of uh, phase out of this current situation. And we are looking at it every day, even though right now our orders don't take precedent over the governor's, we continue to monitor them. We continue to try to come up with ways to begin to get people back to work. That is, that is a key part of what we deal with every day. Um, so, Anyway, that's that's just a little bit of an update. Uh, I mean, we could we could spend the entire meeting talking about this virus, but uh, if council has any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. I have one. Okay. Council okay. here. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you for your leadership, and also I wanted to uh, give out a uh, little information to say, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Olive. About it all, Kendall, uh, uh, that was released from St. Francis. Uh, wanted to let you know that I spoke with her on yesterday. That she's uh, a personal friend and also a constituent, and she's been very busy in this community. So well, I let her know that everyone had been praying for her and for her safe recovery, and she's coming along. She's still uh, basically sheltered in place for a while, trying to get it together. And my other uh, uh, question, my only question was, uh, with our employees, are we doing okay? Anyone that needs access to testing, have they been able to access it? As far as I know, that uh, most of our employees that have have had access. And you know, listen, this this disease is just like any other infectious disease. It, the circle tends to tighten, and so we have had people within the government that have uh, have have either been uh, uh, in close proximity to somebody that's tested positive, or they may have tested positive themselves. Uh, we have a uh, a very rigorous uh, set of protocol that our HR department, under the guidance of Reether Hollowell, uh, follows in guiding our department heads on how to deal with anybody who may have uh, who have come into a situation like that. Uh, I can tell you that in every instance, we followed that CDC and DPH protocol, and we're going to continue to do that in the event anybody either comes into contact with somebody that's tested positive or if they test positive themselves. Mayor, okay. I, have a question. I have a question. This is Mimi. Yes, um, just, uh, hello, I'm happy to see everyone's doing well, and thank you for your leadership, too. Um, I had a question for you because you said um, when you were quoting the numbers, you mentioned that um, there were some that didn't even show the system. How were they? How did that process go? Because everything I've watched, it says you have to have at least one of the system in order to be tested. So how how did that occur? Because there might be people out here, there might be panicking that want to be tested, but won't because of the fact that um, they don't have any of the system. And secondly, how is this being um, paid for, for the citizens that they were to be tested? Um, Mercy, Mercy Med, when they had they contracted with a vendor to a, um, to to utilize about twelve hundred tests, they had some specific protocols. One was you had to be showing at least one of the symptoms, or 
you had to have been able, you had to have been in direct contact with somebody that had tested positive. So that's where most of the asymptomatic individuals uh, came from. Uh, as far as paying for it, I, I think Mercy Med covered those that were uninsured. But when you came through that line, and, I, and I'll tell you that speaking to uh, Dr. Hiltz at DPH, she said she, the most organized thing she's ever seen was the way they were operating that through the parking lot uh, at uh, Cascade Hills Church. Um, and they had to have two pieces of uh, identification there, their, um, their driver's license, and then they also had to show a, an insurance card. So they filed the bulk of these on insurance, but if anybody was unable to pay, uh, Mercy Maid covered it. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Mayor Pops here. Now yes, might sir. be the time to now might be the time to let the community know about the uh, community warriors and the forward thinking on your part to take a lot of the pressure from our first responders. I, well, I tell you, uh, Council Barnes, you have been such a, an integral part of the River Valley Regional Commission and specifically the Area Agency on Aging. And I know basically what I did was give you an idea and hand it off and and you you uh, you you ran it ran it across the goal line. So why don't you share with council and the public what what we're doing with that? Um, the mayor doing some excellent forward thinking. Wanted to take and anticipated that there may be a surge in nine one one calls. So what he did, he called me in, in, on a Sunday <laughs> and asked me to what what we could do. And I called uh, Katie Howard, who is, has been. Uh, the really prime resource for it, for the seniors here. And uh, Mr. Jim Livingston, who is the executive director of the River Valley Regional Commission. And, uh, and I thought about us connecting with Hay Clay and the community volunteers and gave them a call. And they said that they um, were, were, were willing to respond. Now, something like this here is an undertaking and a half because with this virus and exposure. And so it took us about um, from Sunday until uh, Wednesday, and what Katie Howard um, came up with, she contacted rest care, because when you go into the homes with seniors, they're, they're special. if you're not trained on how to lift them, um, transport them, and primarily the goal, by the way, is that the 911 operators, they get calls from seniors who have fallen, who uh, uh, can not get out of the bathtub, who need to be transported from the bed to the, to the potty, from the potty to the bed, and other things of that nature. And it takes up a lot of time of our first responders. So the mayor being forward thinking, that was his concern. And so the individuals, uh, we have, I think, 14 individuals that have committed to take those calls. So a protocol was worked out between all of us. And i like to mention Chief Lang, Chief Futrell, Captain Hazen, um, Jim Livingston, Katie Howard, Hi, Clay, and his 14 volunteers, Ms. Candace Poole from the United Way. We all worked uh, feverishly to try to get this uh, in operation. And so for seniors, if they call the 911 center, there is a person that's identified that will call one of the um, community volunteers who would be dispatched to the home. Those volunteers, um, there would be three of them dispatched at any one time. For any liability issues, they are covered under the uh, Good Samaritan Act. They have P uh, the mayor really worked. They have PPE equipment, not only for themselves, but when they enter the home, they will also put the mask on the seniors as well. And so there's a protocol worked out that uh, um, that in the event that a senior calls, um, those volunteers would go to the home. A very uh, uh, important for seniors to take care of that without it being a load for our first responders. And again, Mr. Mayor, during our discussions, um, it was really forward thinking on your part. Chief Lang and also um, <laughs> Captain Hazen were saying what, what, what an impact um, this will have for because they expect to be very busy, and this is something that's deeply appreciated by those first responders. Well, Pop, certainly appreciate the role you played in that, and I and I thank you for trying to give me credit. But I got to give it back to our uh, our interim fire chief, Chief Lang. Uh, he and I discussed this, and we we kind of brainstormed about some things we could try to do. And 
And the end result, though, is that this community came through again, as it always does. And I, and there are dozens of stories yeah, of people stepping up and, and helping other people within the community uh, during this time. So it's uh, it, it, it's not surprising, but it sure is gratifying. Thank you for your help with that. All right. Mr. Any Morris, other? Councillor uh, Thompson, just a quick question for you yes, uh, that some of the citizens want have, have called and asked me about our transit system. And they're saying that they're seeing more than the amount that's allocated to be on the uh, buses. And they're, they're asking about the safety of the drivers. Uh, so do we have a protocol? We have something in place that uh, say how many people are able to ride the bus at one time? We we do have some protocol in place for the operations of Metra. Uh, I'm going to ask the city manager if he would kind of touch on that a little bit. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good morning to each of you. Um, our public transit system uh, put in uh, place uh, the protocols. Uh, they are acknowledging protocols from Federal Transit Administration and from uh, the state of Georgia. And so um, we've, um, uh, for the drivers, they're wearing uh, the mask, of course. And when people board the bus, they're not sitting next to each other. And we are trying not to allow them to sit across from each other. Uh, I talked to uh, Metro Director Rosa uh, Evans uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, she indicated only during peak hours uh, that she have concern, and then she was going to implement a process for peak hours uh, to ensure that if more than the allotted number of people get on a particular bus, uh, they were either going to transport them on a, a different bus or a van or mini bus that we don't have people sitting next to each other. And from what she's explained to me, um, that, that they are not having to instruct the citizens uh, regarding uh, social distancing. Uh, when they get on the bus, it, it's automatic. And so I think they get it. And uh, and so we uh, understand that there are written protocols that uh, Metro Director Rosa Evans and her team have put in place. So we're conscious of that. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Any other questions or comments before we move on? Mr. Well, thank all of you, Council, for what you are doing during this, this pandemic, too. I know you are keeping your uh, constituents as informed as possible, and I, I know you all are doing a great job under some trying times. Uh, I'm going to move on to, uh, to the city attorney's agenda. Uh, Ms. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Yes. Mayor, I'm sorry. Before we move on, I did just want to go back. Uh, when I was conducting the roll call, I did not call Councilor Woodson, but for the record, she is present. Got it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Fay. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everybody. The only business item we need to vote on today is the ordinance extending the moratorium for certificates of occupancy on type one personal care home or foster care home for, the, for an additional 90 days going through July 26, 2020. And that is ready for adoption uh, on one reading today. Mr. Mayor, you can ask for the ayes and the nays. I'll move for approval. Move approval. I have a question. All right. There's there's a motion and a second to approve. Councilor Woodson, yeah. motion. Uh, yes. Um, when you look at the agenda, it has it on first reading. Is that just a typo error? No, no, that's just that's just a category. Uh, during a period of emergency, we can adopt something on one reading, so there is no second reading. You're just going to adopt it today when it first appears. Okay, so in a, any emergency time, it doesn't have to go through a second reading. That's it could be correct. Dramatic. You can adopt on one All right. reading. All right, thank you for that clarification. Sure. Appreciate it. Thank this you. This is Councillor Crabb. I have a question. Okay. Is what's the reasoning behind extending this for an additional 90 days? Say that again, please. What's the reasoning behind the extension for another 90 days? Well, the uh, code inspection uh, and planning may want to weigh in, but they were 
they were studying trying to do a survey of all of these type one homes and uh, of course with the period of emergency they really haven't been able to get out in neighborhoods but they can weigh in also if they want to okay well that's that's it that's what i thought it was but i wanted it on the record that's fine thanks any more questions or discussion all right, if not, I'm going to ask the clerk to call roll so that you can register your votes on this. Mayor Pro Tem Allen. I vote in favor. Councilor Barnes. I vote in favor. Councilor Kraft. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Garrett. Yes. Councilor House. Yes. Councilor Huff. Yes. Councilor Thomas. Yes. Councilor Thompson. Yes. Councilor Woodson. Yes. Mr. Mayor, that was approved unanimously by the 10 members present. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, okay. Mr. City Attorney, do you have anything else? Uh, just the, um, the Mayor Pro Tem and I and some others had had discussions about the the date for the license renewals and the occupation taxes possibly being delayed further until June 1, but that can be discussed uh, now or amongst yourselves and brought back if uh, council desires to push that date back. Okay, well, we'll get some, we'll, we'll bring it back because I think we probably at least ought to get some comments from finance and, and, uh, and make sure that everybody's on the same page. And we've got time right. to bring that back. That's right. There's plenty of time on that one. But that's all we had today, Mayor. Thanks, sir. And we don't have anybody on the uh, public agenda, but I want council to know that we are working out a, a, a process by which people can still address the council uh, from a public agenda standpoint. We want to make sure that they have access to their elected officials. Uh, so we we actually have the ability to do that now, but nobody signed up. So going forward, uh, we we do have a process that we'll be we'll be utilizing. Mr. City Manager, we'll move on to your agenda. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've got just a few items uh, on my agenda. Uh, first is a condemnation of parcel T A dash A of the intersection improvement along Buena Vista Road and we know it has moved for approval, but you can go ahead and talk about it. I'm so excited. Second. Okay. So we know it as the, the spider web. Uh, the parcel is requested for condemnation in agreement of all parties uh, for acquisition and for title. Um, to keep this project on schedule, it's necessary to condemn and pay the offering, uh, the offered money into the clerk of superior court, thereby uh, taking possession of the property, allowing the city to proceed with the project. And, and this is indeed uh, an important project. You know that this project is funded by uh, the Transportation Improvement Act known as TIA. And so uh, there's been a motion, but we, are, uh, we request the acquisition of this parcel um, for the intersection improvement along Buena Vista Road, um, the uh, total take of property for the county road and or municipal street purposes and authorizing the filing of declaration of taking by the city attorney or his representative under the authority of the official code of Georgia. And so we asked uh, for your approval on this uh, uh, condemnation. All right, there's a motion to approve by Councillor Huff and a second by Councillor Woodson. Councillors, are there any questions or comments, any discussion? Well, after clearing it with our resident parliamentary expert, Councillor Thomas, uh, what we'll do is I'll ask for a voice vote right now. All those in favor say aye. 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 Are there any councillors who object to passing this ordinance? All right, then that's a unanimous approval. Uh, next, Mr. Mayor, I've, uh, I'm requesting uh, approval to submit and accept an animal welfare grant for $20,000 from Petco. Second. All right, there's a motion approved by Councillor Allen and a second by Councillor Woodson. Any discussion to the acceptance of the grant? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any member of council who objects to the passing of this, this purchase? 
All right, it's, it's passed unanimously. Uh, next up, we got a, a $9,495 grant uh, with no match for equipment to enhance. Uh, Second. All right, there's a motion from Councilor Allen. Who made the second? John House. Okay, Councilor House seconded it. Any discussion? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, on this any, next one. Is there any counselor that objects to the approval of that order or that purchase? All right, it's passed. On this next one, Mayor and Council, we really want to commend, commend and thank the uh, River Dragons. Uh, they are donated $11,600 um, to um, help part-time Civic Center event staff who are unable to work as we've canceled or postponed many of the events at the Civic Center. Uh, there's no cost to the city, and they are uh, donating $11,600 to help those part-time workers. And we ask your approval, but we want to thank you. Second. All right, Madam Clerk, could you get that motion second? I believe that was a motion by Crab, Councilor Crab, and then seconded by Woodson. Is that correct? Okay. Any discussion? Yeah. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Is there anybody that objects to approving the rece receiving of that donation? All right, that passes. And I just want to say that this is a vendor, y'all. This is somebody that rents space for us to put on a product at the Civic Center. And from the day that Civic Center was had suspended operation they contacted the city manager almost immediately uh, and said we want to do something for the folks that are going to be without work so i again it just you know in, in very trying times we we were fortunate to witness some of the big-hearted uh, acts and the kindness of, of people that uh, just make you glad to be living in the city mr mayor yes uh, Mr. City Manager, Mr. Mayor, I uh, just want to, while we're on the subject of the River Dragons, uh, I'd like to encourage you, if you haven't already, but uh, to reach out to the general manager, maybe talk to them about some of their future plans and ideas that they have to uh, maybe utilize some of our facilities, uh, a possibility of utilizing our facilities. We'll do it. We've, we've received a letter from from, uh, from him, and, and we... Uh, we will follow up to see what the what the possibility of putting those into action are. Thank you. Yep. Uh, next, I've got um, just four purchases. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, replacement playground equipment at five of our parks, uh, funded by Community Development Block Grant, five hundred fifty-one thousand one hundred twenty-eight dollars. Approval. Second. Second. All right, motion, motion second approve A. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And uh, Mr. Mayor, any council that objects to the passing of that uh, equipment? Uh, I'm sorry, City Mayor. This is what my parliamentarian told me. I, I, I get it. I get it. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, uh, but you're those, good. Parts, those parts include Anderson Village, Cooper Creek Park, Ewat Park, Fluellen Park, Rose Hill Heights, and Tillis uh, Gym. And so um, we are happy that uh, CDBG is able to step in once again and support uh, a community development uh, or community development projects. Um, next, I've got facilities, maintenance, repair, and operations, industrial supplies, and tools uh, on an as-needed basis. Uh, I can tell you that the city expended uh, roughly $358,000 over the last five years uh, utilizing a Georgia State contract for uh, these various supplies. And we've got multiple vendors that we're uh, asking that we continue to do business with. And we're asking the council to approve uh, moving forward uh, uh, with these vendors. Move to approve. Second. Second. All right, there's a motion second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any member of council objects to passing this particular purchase? It's approved. 
Uh, next, I've got a forklift replacement. It's $43,744 for the Fleet Management Division of Public Works. Uh, they use the forklift to load and unload pallets from vehicles as well as haul, uh, to haul other heavy equipment throughout the fleet shop. We're asking you to approve it. Second. Motion second to approve. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any council object to the passing of that purchase? It's approved. Um, and the last item on the purchase agenda, we're asking your approval to purchase um, an automated victim notification system. Uh, the Georgia law regarding crime victims bill of rights um, says that uh, crime victims have the right to receive automated notifications regarding court proceedings and timely notice of the arrest, release, or escape of the offender. And so we're asking your approval in the amount of Second. Motion and a second to approve. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any member of council object to passing that purchase? It's approved unanimously. And uh, Mr. Mayor, I've got a series of updates and these updates are not intended to be long, of course. Uh, if you uh, have questions, uh, then it may go a little longer than we anticipated, but I uh, thought it would be important to uh, share with you and uh, the public, uh, those of you on my television uh, or live streaming regarding our city operations during COVID-19. Uh, and the mayor uh, spoke earlier about uh, the operations of the government and how things are, are going. And certainly, I concur with the mayor, things uh, are going well. Uh, as you know, on Monday, April 6th, uh, the Columbus Consolidated Government started restricting or limiting public access to uh, CCG public buildings due to uh, ongoing development with uh, COVID-19. Uh, CCG department heads and elected officials released plans of plans to transition uh, to work remotely or work from home and or alternate work schedules for employees. Uh, the CCG has remained open, as you heard the mayor say earlier, for business, and we continue to provide the essential services citizens expect, uh, though through a modified or non-traditional way. Uh, we continue to comply with the executive orders of the governor uh, and uh, our mayor, uh, Skip Henderson, and I wanted to uh, take this time to just thank uh, the citizens of Columbus uh, for their patience and understanding regarding adjustments in CCG operations as our goal uh, is to keep them safe, uh, keep our employees safe, uh, flatten the curve and get back to normalcy as soon as possible. And I want to remind citizens that they can go to columbusca.org uh, to find information on how to do business with various city, city departments with their adjusted schedules as they work remotely or use alternate work schedules. Um, if citizens encounter any problem contacting a city department, uh, they should call 311, the Citizen Services Center, uh, for assistance. And so we are open, uh, we're doing business, and we believe that we are taking care of those essential services, the needs of the citizens, and want to thank again the citizens for their patience and want to commend and thank our employees as the mayor did earlier uh, for their creative thoughts, ideas, uh, their innovation and in making sure that uh, we keep the government open uh, though the building uh, buildings are restricted uh, or limited in public access. Uh, they have done an awesome job making sure that we take care of the needs of the citizens and so I do want to commend of the employees of the Columbus Consolidated Government. And uh, I will answer any questions if there are questions about uh, what is going on in terms of uh, the modified or non-traditional work schedules, working remotely, working from home, uh, and or alternate work schedules if council members have any questions. Okay, hearing none, uh, I will move on to my next uh, topic. Uh, Councilor Thomas, uh, noted that we've had a number of city department heads to transition uh, out of the government for various reasons. And 
uh, wanted just a brief update on uh, where we are with uh, those department head vacancies. And uh, I can tell you, um, under the city manager, we've got uh, community reinvestment, uh, inspections and codes director. Um, uh, John Hutchison's last day uh, is this Friday, April 17th. Uh, we've got the civic center director that's vacant. We've got the public works director who's retiring at the end of June of this year. And so we've gone ahead and advertised uh, that position. And so uh, the positions have been advertised and will be advertised until filled. Uh, community reinvestment and inspections and codes report to Deputy City Manager Pam Hodge and Civic Center and Public Works report to Deputy City Manager Lisa Goodwin. And I want you to know that we are using our usual advertising outlets. Our HR director has done a good job with that to ensure that we get candidates from across the nation. Uh, and I can tell you that we will hire the best candidate we can attract uh, with our salary schedule. And so um, community reinvestment, um, I know that uh, uh, Deputy City Manager Pam Hodge is getting close uh, with a selection on that position uh, and uh, inspections and codes as uh, advertised until field, Civic Center advertised until field, and Public Works is advertised until field with the director retiring June of 2020. And I will answer any questions you have about uh, that subject at this time if there are any. Okay. Um, Mr. City Manager, let me let me add that there is one more department head uh, vacancy. Uh, Interim Chief uh, uh, Lang is doing an amazing job over at Fire uh, and EMS, but we are in the process. We've got a search firm that's put some uh, materials together and is aggressively searching uh, for candidates uh, for us to interview. And very similar to what the City Manager mentioned, uh, we are we are going to. We're going to get the very best person we can find within our salary structure uh, to lead to lead what is a, just an incredible department. Uh, but I did want you to know that that is underway, that the uh, uh, he is aggressively and actively looking for candidates, and uh, we have an aggressive timeline. Uh, but we recognize that because our world is a little different now than it was just four to six weeks ago, uh, we we uh, we are able to uh, let this go a little bit longer if necessary to get the right person. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And so city manager. Yes, sir. Did you say uh, Deputy City Manager uh, Hodge is looking at a candidate for which position? Uh, community reinvestment uh, is what she is. Um, uh, working on right now and uh, we have a um, I have a selection recruitment uh, team of staff and uh, composed of uh, both the deputy city managers uh, the HR director and the finance director and so they are my interview selection team and uh, they've gone through their process and um, the um, deputy city manager Hodge is getting close uh, to a select the selection of a candidate uh, that she will bring forward to me. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, next on the agenda, you know that uh, the president and Congress passed a, a uh, stimulus packet and um, we are requiring that um, uh, our team look hard and close at that stimulus packet to make sure that we don't miss any opportunities to receive funding. Uh, I've uh, asked uh, Deputy City Manager Lisa Goodwin to uh, keep track of um, the um, stimulus uh, funding, and I am going to ask her to give a brief update on what she is doing in that regard. Uh, thank you, Mr. City Manager. Good morning, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, I have contacted um, each of the department directors and our elected officials. Uh, what we're asking is that they research uh, in their particular area any funding or grants, particularly those under the CARES Act, uh, which is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act that um, was a 
approved by Congress uh, that the two that's the two to two trillion dollar um, response bill that the city manager has just mentioned. Uh, we've asked them to look talk with their um, associations, any of the memberships that they are a part of, to ensure that we don't miss any funding that might be available to us. So they're che they're checking and they're researching and they'll send all of that information to me um, uh, once awarded any of those grants because we want to, have, if you will, have a clearinghouse so that everything comes to one location and that we can then um, send that out on a weekly basis to the city manager that way he will then forward it out to ensure that we all stay abreast of the funding that is coming through. To date, off that CARES Act funding, Metro Transit has received $6.9 million, uh, and that's $6,987,789 under the CARES Act. CDBG has received $981,189 under the CARES Act. And we know that there's a lot more out there that we can tap into. And that's why we're asking all department heads, all elected officials in their responsive areas uh, to ensure that they look under every rock to make sure that we haven't missed anything. Because at the end of the day, we wanna make sure that once we get back to some sense of normalcy, that it's not, we, we don't discover that there was money out there that we did not tap into. Uh, and so everyone's being quite vigilant in making that happen. Uh, again, they'll send all of that information to me. Uh, we will document, keep all of that um, you know, together and document uh, in a spreadsheet format that we can forward on um, to the city manager, mayor, so that everybody will know exactly what we have coming into our local community. Lisa, I have a question. This is Mimi. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, I had a question for you. Is every, uh, is every department sending you an update of which um, grant they went after? and for how much they applied or what they try to do. My reason for saying that if we can get a list and keep track of it, we can see the departments that have found every avenue or if they needed assistance in locating some of these dollars and, and funds, or is there someone designated to oversee all these? Well, again, each department is handling that on their own, but now once the allocation or the award has been made uh, after they have researched, they're sending all of that information to me. That way I will know exactly what dollars have been awarded to which of our agencies, uh, our departments. But uh, again, in terms of uh, what they're going after, you know, who they're looking at and um, those funding agencies, they're not sending that information to me. But of course, I can certainly get with them just to see who's doing what. We can look could at you, that. Could you follow up? I want to make sure. sure that, you know, like you said, we can look at all the um, funds that might be available because mm -hmm. we have wonderful employees, but we're so busy and we're in such a uh, different world there might be something that falls among the cracks. That's and if right. there's a second looking at, second person looking at it, they might be able to assist them. Like they say, it's better two heads than one. That's right. So and most departments, right. And most departments, what they're doing is they are assigning that task to an individual within that department. Uh, and that may be the person who is actually working to um, contact their associations, their member groups, uh, other like communities to see, you know, who else is getting what or who's tapping into what. And so that's some of the resources that they're using. Fantastic. Thank you for that information. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Yes. Mr. Uh, Mayor, I have a question. <clears throat> um, Mr. City Manager, at some point along the way, I would like to have from um, the Finance Department a report on how much money we are losing as a city. For example, I know that our sales tax has got to be down. Our uh, hotel motel tax has got to be down. Uh, you know, all of those kinds of calls of the, the closures and so forth. I'm not asking for that today, but at some point uh, we need to have that kind of information so that as we are getting these um, reports from the deputy city manager on grants and so forth, 
we will have some idea of where we are financially. Um, I, I don't. I know that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, several of our uh, department, um, like the CVB, the Convention and Business Bureau, they are having a real problem because of the closure and the lack of taxes coming in. So I'm sure you get my my drift here. Just like to have some kind of a report. And if you have any thoughts off the top of your head this morning. Uh, I would appreciate hearing about it. Well, certainly um, we are attempting to um, make projections on how we think we are going to be impacted from a revenue standpoint. And and yes, we've heard from the, the CVB, as, as you know. Um, I've been tracking uh, stories um, in the media through Georgia Municipal Association, through the National League of Cities and all of the information that I'm able to research and find I'm uh, forwarding that to um, our finance people to make sure that they see uh, what uh, pr the projections are for others across uh, the state of Georgia and across uh, the nation. Uh, certainly there's going to be an impact. We know that some hotels are, are shut down. They're closed and and that is having is going to have a significant impact on hotel motel tax uh, in this last quarter and um, in uh, the, the new fiscal year. And uh, we've made some projections that um, hotel motel tax, for example, could be down up to 50 percent, up to 50 percent. And when we know that the Civic Center gets two percent of the hotel motel tax, uh, the Trade Center gets 1% of the hotel motel tax, but they get uh, in excess of 750000 on beer tax. And then the River Center gets 1% of hotel motel tax. And then the CVB gets 4% to make up the 8%. And if that 4% is down as much up to 50%, the CVB will have significant challenges. And likewise with the Civic Center, if it's down as much as 50% and they get 2% of the hotel motel tax, while we've been able to operate with a positive uh, cash flow, um, that may change significantly. And, and the question is, will others be looking to the city or general fund to support uh, those uh, declines in revenue? We know that hotel motel tax uh, is going to have a significant impact. And in and, and talking to the finance director, we've gone back to look at um, a post-2008 recession uh, hotel motel tax, excuse me, uh, sales tax collections to try and get an idea, you know, how things shift after a recession. And so as we bring forward projections to you, we're taking all those things into consideration. But certainly, Councillor Thomas, uh, we will be coming forward to you with what you've asked for. And I would also request that as part of the, um, the budget review that we're going to be entering into in a, a couple of weeks, that this be a, a um, significant part of that. Because sure. it's going to impact our budget, not just for the next couple of weeks, uh, but for the next year or so or more. Yes. Thank you. Yes. The city manager, just to give you a little insight on the um, on the subject at hand, uh, the national <laughs> average right now for hotel occupancy is at 10%. Um, I don't think 83 uh, or uh, the Great Recession is going to be a good comparison because uh, at the time, I think everybody knows that we had BRAC going on that was really a, a big um, boost for our local economy. We don't have that now, so I don't think you can make that comparison. I think it's totally different. Um, so however you're figuring your projections, I think you ought to take that in consideration. Um, I don't think, again, uh, there's going to be no comparison to uh, to the time of the Great Recession. So, uh, and that's what 2008, 2009. But I do, we do know that. Uh, I've heard that 
some of the quote saving grace in the hospitality industry has been with the government, uh, especially with the National Guard. I don't know. I've heard some hotels have uh, National Guard or government uh, type um, accommodations going ongoing. I'm not so sure in Columbus. I know in other places, but I can tell you the national average is around 10%. Councilor Davis, 10% of what? As far 10% as I, normal occupancy, 10% of rooms available, 10% of what? 10% total occupancy across the country. Of rooms available? On average. Of and, total and, rooms available. Yeah, and, and Councilor Davis, I, I agree. In other words, you. it's severely impacted. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and Councilor Davis, I do agree with you that there, there's no comparison, but that's the one comparison that we could look to. Uh, this is a, an unprecedented um, event uh, for us, uh, at least in, in my lifetime. And uh, I, I've never known of an event where hotels completely shut down and restaurants completely shut down and with takeout orders and, you know, the, the malls are closed. It's unprecedented. And so... Um, and, and I sent, um, um, I, I sent the, the staff yesterday, the finance staff, an article that I pulled from uh, National League of City, and I titled that uh, email to the staff yesterday, the finance director and deputy city manager Hodge, tough days ahead, because we recognize that when you read these stories of other communities and the drastic measures that they are going to in preparation of uh, what's ahead? Um, it's it, it it it's that that same thing is going to happen in our city, and we have got to um, uh, we've got a plan for uh, the the worst, you know, and and just hope for the best. But uh, we like those others in those stories that I'm reading that I'm sending to finance, and I've sent them multiple stories that I'm pulling in Georgia and outside of Georgia. We've got some tough days ahead, so we do recognize that we don't. There's no good comparison, but we're going to use what the, the research that we can um, that we can get gain access to here in Columbus and in Georgia, but also look across the nation. Yeah, and, I, and look, I'm positive on the outlook. I think it's going to take a while. Uh, I think there will be a pinup demand later, but maybe uh, in the upcoming year towards the uh, towards the fourth quarter. But I, I, I do. I'm optimistic from the standpoint. I think. I think people, the American citizens, uh, will get out and they'll travel again. I think there's going to have to be a a period of people getting comfortable with with doing that. Um, uh, I, I can't forecast that, but uh, it's just some of the trends that I'm seeing in the industry, and I just I hope that uh, that 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 will take place. But it might be a slow process, and we may see some. Uh, positive results uh, in in the uh, fourth quarter of the upcoming year. And let, sure. let let me just pipe in, and I want to share something with Councilor Thomas. I want to thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I've been in a number of uh, communications and conversations with the uh, the city manager, the deputy city managers, our finance director, uh, trying to do just that, trying to do what Councilor Davis just referenced uh, is almost the impossible. And that is take a very unique event and try to find the closest thing we can to it as a baseline or a benchmark. And then we start adjusting based on uh, particular uh, both national, regional, and local trends. Uh, I, I can tell you I'm so grateful for the folks that we have working on it, though, because uh, and, and Angelica Alexander, our finance director, she is so tight, she squeaks when she walks. So <laughs> she is watching every penny. She is very conservative in her estimates. But I think what you guys just uh, articulated is uh, it's kind of like stating the obvious in that our world looks different today than it did just six months, six weeks ago. And as, as the mayor putting together a budget with a, an excellent team, we were almost giddy with some of the things that we wanted to get done that had, we'd wanted to do, do for a long period of time. And we, we, we really had been, council had been such careful stewards of the finances over the last year or two that, that we were gonna be able to do them. And then over the course of two weeks, 
most of that's out the window. We're looking now at trying to make sure we can provide the functions of the government, take care of our people as best we can, and uh, and and make it through uh, this this dip in our economy. Uh, so so we got we've got some interesting deliberations ahead, but I promise you that this staff and and I will do everything I can to make sure y'all have the information you need. Mayor, if I might add again on a positive note, like encouraging you do have plans to travel in the future once some of these, um, I guess, um, struggling finding a word here, some of the declarations that are put out there for uh, essential travel, let's just put it that way, um, uh, essential travel. Um, I, you know, the hospitality industry is taking steps to really make sure that uh, people can uh, can be assured that they're safe. I mean, they're really taking the steps to uh, to make sure that the properties are protected and, and uh, sanitized. And, uh, and I know the employees are going above and beyond the ones that still are, are there on the property. So... Uh, that's assuring. I think industries across the board are doing that. As you said earlier, the world's changing uh, how we approach things. So that's going to be a good thing. So people can feel safe about travel. And I really, I really believe that. Um, and we want them to travel uh, and, and get back to how things were before. So uh, I'd say that as a, a word of encouragement and that people really don't have to worry about that. I think that I, I think good things are happening that uh, people can be assured that they're safe uh, when they travel. Um, Thank you. Okay, Mr. Mayor, if there are no other comments, uh, I am going to move on with the other topics that I have. Um, I've got Deputy City Manager Hodge, who is going to touch on a number of topics. Uh, topics. Uh, the first is Virginia College update. Then she's going to talk about the infrastructure projects uh, during COVID-19. Uh, she's going to talk about the government center SPLOS. And, uh, and, um, and so we're going to turn to Deputy City Manager Pam Hodge on those subjects, and she will flow from one into, uh, to the next. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Council. It's so good to see all of you uh, doing well. Um, I'll first start out with the Virginia College um, update. Uh, IT is uh, moving the slides for me, so I'll just ask them to go um, through each of the slides. Um, this is the exterior of the Virginia College uh, building, which will be the home of the uh, Department of Public Health. Uh, you can see that the exterior work is moving forward. We expect to have the paving of the parking lot and the exterior area done in the next couple weeks. Uh, going on to the next slide, you can see the interior of the building. Uh, most of the mill work has been installed. Um, they're doing the final painting and hanging doors. Uh, if you go to the next slide, again, this is just an example of one of the exam rooms. Uh, and they are make, making really great progress on this facility. Uh, they are practicing all of the COVID-19 requirements as they're inside the building and outside the building working. And then the next slide just shows uh, one of the break rooms. Uh, so you can see that they've uh, really done a great job uh, moving forward with this project. Um, our expected completion date is sometime next month, so they are ahead of schedule. We have been coordinating uh, with the health department throughout the entire uh, renovation of this facility. They've had their maintenance folks, their IT folks um, in the building. Uh, we're in the process of scheduling um, a, a, a walkthrough with some of uh, the folks with um, the state uh, office so that they can uh, see the progress that we've been made. Of course, practicing social distancing during um, any activities that happen at this facility. So I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, related to Virginia College. Hearing none, I'll move on to just a quick update on Am infrastructure. I yes, ma'am. Ma I do have a um, You say we are um, online with the timing of this. What about with the cost of this? 
Uh, we're still within our budget that we had provided to council um, on this. We have um, made one alteration uh, related to um, uh, maintaining the um, refrigeration system. Originally, we were going with a UPS um, type uh, uh, backup system, and we have now changed to a generator, uh, but we're still maintaining within the budget that council has approved. Great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, moving forward with the infrastructure project update, just a quick update on some of the uh, major projects that's going on around the city. Uh, the River Road roundabout, uh, the contractor is completing the landscaping and the irrigation installation, uh, and we expect that project to be 100% complete by the end of April. Uh, the Fort Benning Road roundabout and streetscapes, uh, that work is continuing on the roundabout and the streetscapes. Uh, the roundabout should be completed this month uh, and the streetscapes completed by the end of the year. So that would be uh, by December of 2020, uh, the entire project uh, will be completed. The Reese Road Bridge, those bids are due back April 22nd. Uh, the expected road closure will be either in late May or early June, and that just depends on the utility relocation. So that project uh, for the replacement of Reese Road Bridge is moving forward. On Calumet, uh, we are moving forward with that. We have a private fiber line uh, that we might have a possible conflict. So that company is out uh, trying to locate their fiber line. We obviously don't want to disconnect the fiber line of this uh, private company. Uh, so once they have uh, located that fiber line and we can make sure that it, there's not any conflict, uh, we will start uh, as soon as possible. The, the contractor is ready to move forward. Uh, Salmon Road, Beaver Run intersection. Uh, GDOT is installing the right turn lanes on Beaver Run onto Salmon Road. Uh, the signal and the Salmon Road improvements should be ready to bid in August or September. So that project is uh, moving forward. Uh, the spider web, obviously we had uh, condemnation on the agenda today. Uh, the construction on the west side of the bridge will start in the next few weeks. Uh, this includes the rough grading uh, for the temporary road, uh, utility relocation, uh, construction of a new section of Annette Avenue, uh, the roundabout at Annette Avenue and MLK Junior Boulevard, and a new traffic signal at Annette Avenue and Buena Vista Road. So you'll start to see some work in that area. This will all be on the west side of where the actual bridge will take place, uh, but it's going to be under construction for several years as we uh, complete that spiderweb project. So any questions on any of the infrastructure projects? Pam, what was the completion date on Calumet? Uh, once they get started, it should be about three months. Uh, we're, like I said, waiting on that uh, private fiber uh, to be located. Um, once we make sure there's no conflict, then we'll be able to move forward with that relatively quickly. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Pam, yeah. On the spiderweb project, you know, are we looking at a completion maybe late 2021 or 22, early 22? It'll be in 2022 or 2023 once okay. we start the bridge. Okay, thank you. Pam, would you mention Tobleton Road? Yes, sir. So Tobleton Road is actually moving uh, forward. This is a GDOT project. Uh, they are ahead of schedule. Um, and, and we've seen a lot of uh, work taking place on Talbotton Road. So that project is uh, set to be complete in 2021, and they are ahead of schedule on that project as well. And let me, let me add that with regards to all of these projects, these, these construction projects uh, continuing, is the importance of them is extremely significant right now in 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 the, the way that we're dealing with things from an economic standpoint to be able to keep construction workers working and to continue to get them to generate some revenue so that that kind of filters through the through the uh, through the community is significant and to that end i know the city manager and i have had some discussions about doing whatever we can from a permitting and and uh, process so that we can uh, expedite anybody that's looking at any construction right now in our community we ought to be looking for every way we can to try to help them uh, 
because the more they construction typically sort of drives uh, the path out of a recession simply because it puts people to work. And I think over the next several months, uh, that's going to be significant. So I uh, thank you, Pam, for, for the update. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'll move on to the Government Center SPLOS. I have one more question. Yes, ma'am. If I can. Um, I, <clears throat> I know this is not one of our uh, projects, but um, at some point I had it seems like it was supposed to be two weeks ago. Um, the Benning Road from the um, Stone Gate entrance to Fort Benning on to Main Post was to be um, that road was to be closed for uh, construction. Do you know if that's happening? I haven't been out. I have been at home, <laughs> well, I haven't been out to see that. Yes, it it is closed. I don't know um, the length of that closure, but it is closed. Okay, I know at one time. And I'll follow up and, and provide counsel an update on that as well. Okay, great, thank you. And so I'll move forward uh, with the Government Center SPLOS um, update. Uh, just to go through the timeline again, Jeremy, first slide. Um, we are in the, the second um, segment, the March 2020 to June 2020. Uh, second series of public meetings. Um, we are still on the timeline that has been outlined to council uh, to be able to uh, meet the November 3rd ballot. And that call for election would be on August uh, the, the 4th. Um, where we're at right now, uh, just next steps uh, for the next slide is uh, in May 2020, we will come to council in some format uh, and make a presentation uh, the um, design team and the construction manager have been hard at work uh, reviewing the four options outlined by council. We will be coming to council to make a formal presentation of those government center options and also to provide a draft project list in order for us to go out to the public the first week of June uh, to provide the public with that information on the government center options and the draft project list, which will include what we're calling an A list and a B list. Things can move back and forth between the A list and the B list until uh, council feels that they have a good project to move forward with. Uh, that will happen uh, working through that process in the month of July in order to have the um, call for the election on August 4th. So we are still, even in these times, uh, moving forward uh, with this evaluation and uh, proceeding forward with the SPLOST on the November ballot. Uh, and we will be coming to council in May uh, to provide that that update and a formal presentation and if we're using this format we will we'll provide the same update in this uh, environment that we would if we were all together in council chambers and i'll be happy to answer any questions about uh, the SPLOST or uh, the government center Jim, I have uh, a question. questions it's councillor huff on the go back to the slide with the uh outline for the meetings and the dates that's where I was going. What are we doing about the actual meetings that we can't have right now? So if you put the timeline, Jeremy, back up, which would be the second slide in the presentation, um, we will utilize um, in the first week of June either a similar format that we're having here. Uh, we could do FaceTime Live. We could have a, a call-in. Um, we'll provide some sort of public meeting format uh, that first week of June. Uh, as the time moves forward, we'll be able to um, determine what that format will look like uh, and how we get that information out into the public, whether we do it on the website, whether we do it on CCG TV. Uh, we'll come up with um, various options so that the public gets the information and is able to ask questions and respond back. Is there a possibility of putting together something because we're going to lose time between now and June, sometime in May, maybe, possibly to have a online meeting like we're doing now, P possibly some way that the public could get online with us and maybe have a, a, a public discussion? 
Yes, we will have a, a form, like I said, a formal presentation to council and um, they'll be able to see it there. And then we'll have that same presentation that will go out in some format uh, to the public for them to um, ask their questions and respond. We're going to have to have a, an interactive process uh, for yeah. the public. I'm saying yes, you're sir. saying June, though. I'm saying what happens to the time that we're losing now? We won't have anything between now and June? We will have the presentation to council, and, and we were scheduling to have formal uh, public meetings the first week of June, but we can do um, interactive things during the month of May as well once we make that presentation to council. Okay, I was just I was just stuck on the part. It says second series of public meetings, March 2020 to June 2020. So I was wondering if we would have any type of discussions with the public during that time before we get a formal presentation. Well, and let me just say that, um, you know, the election um, date has changed a number of times. You know, we were initially scheduled to go out after the March election date that got changed. And then we were going to, we adjusted our timeline to go out uh, after um, the May 19th uh, election date. Now that has changed. And so what we've tried to do is, is be sensitive to other things on the ballot, um, sensitive to not confusing uh, the public uh, with what's on the ballot in terms of the school district and what we are coming forward with. Uh, if they're all going on at the same time. So we've adjusted our schedule a number of times uh, to allow some of those things to get out of the way that we don't uh, start answering questions about what they're doing and they don't start answering questions about what we're doing. So we've tried to adjust our timeline to with, with that, those things in, um, in mind. Uh, but we fully intend to um, have um, open public discussion uh, in a way that they can have uh, input back. Uh, we've got our IT uh, staff uh, looking at uh, all of our options, and, uh, and I, I'm going to brag on them in just a few minutes, but uh, we're confident that we will have a process that, um, <coughs> that uh, all of the citizens can participate in. Those who uh, are on social media, um, those who have internet or don't have internet, uh, I've even talked to them uh, about a, a phone bank similar to what you see on TV when they have these um, um, telethons where um, when you present, you've got three or four people who are answering phones and, and then they can feed the question to the presenter from the elderly person calling in on the phone because they don't have, they don't do social media internet. So we're looking at all of our options and we will make sure that our public have um, input into what we're, we, we know that's important to you, it's important to us, and it's important to them, and we're going to make sure that that happens. Okay. I'd like Thank to make you. a suggestion. We, can we look into maybe having a radio station or a radio group of stations do some presentations? Because they already have the facilities to call in and discuss on the radio and that might be one option that we could consider well well again we're going to look at all options but you know and i told staff when i talked to them i've watched it on abc on our local news where you see all of the people at channel nine or channel three and the phone banks and they were saying ring up the phones no phones are we can we have a tv station you know if they can do it at their tv station we can do it at our TV station. And so, and that's no different than what you would get on the radio. Uh, and so uh, we are looking at all of our options. I hate, I have faith in Michael King. He will make it happen. Thank you, Isaiah. You know, Michael King, along with uh, our IT staff, they're awesome. Uh, you have my vote on that one. Back to you, Pam. So that uh, concludes the three updates that I had for today, and I'll be um, happy to answer any questions, and I will get um, an update out to council about the uh, Benning Road into uh, the gate. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you, Deputy City Manager Hodge. And uh, now I am going to call on our finance director, um, Angela Alexander, to talk about the budget process in, in this time of COVID-19 and social distancing, uh, how we handle that, Angelica Alexander, our finance director. Yes, sir. Good morning, uh, Mr. City Manager, Mr. Mayor, members of council. I'm hopeful that you can hear me. Um, yes. Sometimes, okay, thank you for confirming that. Um, so just as it relates to um, the FY21 budget process, um, here are just some points of um, discussion um, that I'd just like to, um, you know, make mention for council's um, feedback, input, and consideration. Um, for the most part, um, as we go through uh, as we gear up for the FY21 budget process, which most of these budget review hearings are in the month of May, um, we plan to facilitate and deliver um, those budget review sessions in a manner that's similar to our current council meeting. So we'll be utilizing um, Microsoft Teams. Um, all of the budget materials that we typically provide via Jump Drive to uh, council uh, which includes all of the departmental budget requests as well as the, bu the recommended budget document um, will be provided to uh, the budget review committee via SharePoint website. Uh, myself and IT, uh, we are uh, working very di diligently on getting that uh, website set up and making sure that it's easy to, to utilize for, for council. Um, department presentations and materials uh, will be provided via email. Um, prior to uh, each budget uh, review session, um, we are um, limiting uh, this year the length of time for these departmental presentations. Since we'll be utilizing Microsoft Teams and, you know, we want to try to have uh, as best of a flow as we possibly can in regards to these uh, meetings, we'll be limiting the, the time frame for presentations to just 15 minutes. Um, and then again, we're also working out the details with our information um, technology department regarding um, how to facilitate any public comments. In terms of the budget process, the, the public comment section, um, a part of that process really doesn't begin until the, the month of June. Um, so I'm not sure if it will be applicable, but we are exploring all options in regards to addressing public comments, possibly from emails or by telephone. Um, you know, we did reach out to the budget chair to gain some feedback regarding the process this year. Um, but if um, if there's any other input that council may have, um, please feel free to to share that with me. And that's really it in terms of the presentation regarding the process. <coughs> I'll be happy to answer any questions. <coughs> I have a question. Yeah. Um, you said on the slide that the um, presentation, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it said, uh, each department would have 15 minutes? Yes, ma'am. Is that um, 15 minutes for the department head to make the presentation? That's not for the discussion of that portion of the budget, right? Well, that is for the department heads to make their presentation. Sometimes just due to the size of, of the department, um, we do extend a, um, a little bit a longer time frame than that, uh, particularly for our you know public works department or our police department, because a lot of of our larger departments really really utilize um, the budget review process to provide you know updates to council as it relates to the operations and some of the challenges that they may be facing. And so since we are um, you know at this stage. In, in regards to the, the type of meetings that we're having, um, we're just going to limit those presentations to 15 minutes so that they can be succinct, um, to the point, um, and direct in terms of any requests that they may, may be making to um, the Budget Review Committee. Well, I, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not sure what's with my voice today. I do know that, um, we are in different times, but the budget coming up for next fiscal year is going to be very challenging uh, because of what we've talked about earlier, our, our resources and so forth. 
And I don't want us to shortchange the process merely because we've gone through this. I want us to make sure that we are doing and, and um, providing what is needed for our um, smooth operation of the government. So um, these meetings typically take two or three hours, just the budget portion of those meetings. And so uh, I, I really would like to hear from some of the other counselors <clears throat> about what you think we ought to be looking at um, to make sure that we get all the information out that we need to get out. <clears throat> Maybe I'm the only one concerned. I don't know. Well, let me just say, certainly, um, you know, we get behind schedule and sometimes we get ahead of schedule. And as Angelica indicated, some of the smaller departments may come up and say, um, <laughs> I just wanted to come and say thank you. And, and then we get ahead of schedule. But I think certainly departments are going to be we, we're going to hear from them and you're going to hear from them because if they get up there and, and you know, and you, and you get into a, a number of questions, it could go 30 minutes, but we'll catch up on the schedule. So I, I don't think we're going to, um, while we would like to stay on schedule, um, we're not going to not communicate pertinent information to you or uh, them to you or you to them by saying it's a hard 15 minutes. Yeah, I think the, I don't know about last year, uh, year before last, but I know that typically the 15 to 30 minutes is the way it's scheduled to fit slots in for everybody. A lot of them, uh, as the city manager mentioned, will spark a lot of discussion. And there have been many times when it has gone long. Uh, the only other option to that, I think, is to go ahead and schedule it at larger times, which uh, I'm happy to do, but it's going to require more meetings of council uh, to uh, to try to get those all those people in. Um, but but whatever the pleasure of the of the uh, budget committee is, I, I'm fine with. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. City Manager, I, I just uh, just some comments on that. I think uh, since this again is unprecedented times. Uh, we know there's going to be a revenue impact. We just don't know how severe it's going to be. And I, you know what? I, you know, departments can make presentations, but uh, this is we're in a what I would term a crucial management um, kind of scenario. And I'm not so sure we're even going to get a perspective on things until the end of the year. So we may have to think about doing some things different. Um, you know, it's not a time to be asking for needs in a department. I mean, that's just not going to happen. Um, uh, you know, we may want to regroup and rethink about meeting um, at the end of the year, which would be at midterm, and really try to understand where we're at at that point and, and, and regroup. But I, I think what we're going to find out is just, you know, the... I'm not so sure really how the department can give a presentation in this environment, in this financial crisis environment, not a crisis, but a revenue impacted environment. Ms. City Manager, you may want to comment on that. Uh, well, I, I think you're right. And we've had really candid conversation with department heads, you know, the mayor, uh, city manager together, and they understand, and, and you heard the mayor say earlier that, Four weeks ago, when we came to you and we were all giddy, we told you the front balance, the reserve, we were up to 82 days from as low as 60 days. Uh, we, uh, The hotel motel tax was doing really great. Uh, sales tax, I can tell you sales tax, when we came to you four weeks ago, was up like 7% over the year before. And the year before, it had been up over the, the previous year. And, and we were feeling really, really great four weeks ago. I mean, excited. Uh, we, uh, and then, as the mayor said, four weeks later, all that's out the window. And so we've had this conversation with department heads. 
and we've said to them that you know, all that stuff that you submitted when you submitted the budget actually in February, early February, that stuff is not going to happen. It can't happen because we don't know what the end of the year is going to look like. And as you said, Council Davis, we may not know until the end of the year. So there's no way we can bring forward to you and, and make projections that we can do certain things that we, we just we don't know. And so I think when we talk to them, to the department head or elected official, we got nothing but understanding. And so there's no surprise. They, they, I, don't, I don't anticipate that you will have them wanting to get on the agenda to come talk to council. Council may want to put them on the agenda to have them come talk to you because they understand. Right. I just, you know, again, Mr. City Manager, I think the things that uh, we really, you know, it's a good thing that we, um, I guess you look back now and you realize why you, you should build your reserve. I mean, Absolutely. really. Uh, Absolutely. Here we are. And no one ever predicted this, but, you know, there's other things that could happen. You know, God forbid, but, you know, we could have another circumstance to hit our city like we did last year around March uh, uh, with the tornado and so you're going to need you're going to need those resources but uh, key things like just protecting the retirement fund we don't even know how much our retirement fund has been the the employees retirement fund has been uh, impacted just protecting that you may have to make a contribution there we don't know uh, you know, job preservation, things like that. Everybody else in in the business world is in a is in a survival mode right now, just trying to preserve their their operations and keep their operations going. I, I think the city government is is no different. I think we're in the same shape. I just can't. I know there, like I said, I know there's going to be a revenue impact, and you just got to prioritize where we go from here uh, uh, to protect you know, key, uh, key elements of our government. Uh, I, I don't think there's going to be a problem right now with our, our health care plan, but I, I am concerned about the pension plan. Uh, things are getting better, but uh, we don't know. Two in two months from now, that could change. So um, I think you're kind of in a protective mode and just you know, it's not a time to ask. It's a time for everybody to come together and work and, and make sure that we, uh, we protect the uh, the operations and, and keep the services, the key services provided to the citizenry. Uh, yeah, and, and I'll say again, Council, when we talked to those department heads to include elected officials, and we talked about the state of the city and the state of the state and the state of the nation, and they were asking, we had some people asking for five or six new positions. When we talked to them, there were no questions. They know that's not going to happen. And so I, I think we're going to be fine uh, in dealing with department heads and elected officials. Yeah, and I, and I know that we rely so much on the sales tax. I mean, we've been talking about it all throughout the meeting, but we rely so heavy on that. And that's, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's to be seen how that impact is uh, is going to play out. So anyway, thank you, Mr. City Manager. Thank you, uh, Councilor Thomas. Any other questions of Angelica Alexander? Uh, if not, we are going to move on uh, to our uh, Information Technology Department, uh, IT Director Forrest Tolley. I, I wanted. Uh, Director Tolley to talk with you and, and share with uh, our citizens um, uh, how I, IT is, has made the difference in making sure that uh, we're able to do what we're doing today, uh, to make sure that our government remains functional and providing the essential services to the citizens. Um, they have, uh, they were forward thinking from the time that uh, Dr. Tolley came on board, and I am glad that he was forward thinking, and he's built a staff, a team, uh, that has put us exactly where we need to be in times like this. And so I wanted him to come and, and talk about 
how IT has uh, made a difference um, for us during COVID-19. And so with that, uh, Dr. Forrest Tolley. Mr. Mayor, City Manager, Council, um, I'm going to update you on the things that we've been doing. And uh, IT, someone else is driving my slides, so next slide. So it really started with our five-year plan. Uh, uh, really five years ago, I've been here five years and three months. And uh, I'm going to talk about what we plan, what we're doing since March 12th, how we're doing remote, and what our ongoing plan is. Next. So in our five-year plan, um, it, it's kind of vague, but it does say we want integration of technology to support the business function of that space. And we left it vague because that space is remote. It could be your office. It could be your vehicle because we have technology in our police cars. We have it in the sheriff's department. We have it in the EMS, we have it really everywhere in, in the metro buses and even in the IT vehicles. Uh, it addresses uh, a lot of the things that we uh, were anticipating. We didn't anticipate COVID, but we did anticipate a period of where we might have to work remotely. Uh, next. Now, what we're using, the, the main tool, uh, we use Microsoft Skype and we use Microsoft Teams. Microsoft Skype and Teams are similar in the fact that they let you teleconference. Uh, we're on Teams right now. Skype is being phased out by Microsoft in favor of Teams. And the real difference in Teams is that it allows a lot more cloud-based mobility experience so that you can get it on your phone and other devices better than just having to work off your computer. It also improves if you have good internet the audio and video quality, and you can schedule and actually have a team virtual workspace so you can collaborate. Next. As far as the remote workforce, we've been anticipating this for the departments that I directly report to and the ones that I'm directly responsible for. And the mayor's office and the city manager's office have the ability to work remotely. 311 is currently working remotely. We're, we're taking all of our 311 calls from remote locations. Council meeting is being held remotely and being live streamed and it is also being um, televised on our TV station at, currently, like right this minute. So that's good. And I was kind of sweating bullets this morning, hoping that it would be on live stream with me talking about it. Um, the court system is uh, actually, we're live streaming jail police from one of the courtrooms, and we're working to expand that technology to eight of our other courtrooms so that they can um, continue with their proceedings without, in some cases, transporting uh, the um, people, or, but it really reduces the uh, amount of people in the tower if you can do live stream, which is allowed right now. Um, and I think moving forward it will be allowed, but we're working on the courts. Other departments are working remotely, and I'm not going to mention them because I would miss someone if I did, but those that need to work remotely can work remotely. Information technology is working to meet the needs of all the departments, and all the departments of op are, are operational. From a technology standpoint, we have all of our technology operational. And other uses of cloud technology are all the different things we're doing so that you can get your um, files from anywhere. You can get do your work from anywhere. So we're making general use of other cloud technologies. And I want to thank council, the city manager, and the mayor for having that in our budgets to, to um, be prepared for this. So we have these technologies and we're deploying them. The biggest challenge I think that we've been seeing for the nine IT staff is the learning curve for the new technology. As we, um, we have the technology, and now that people want to use it all, all at once, a lot of people are, are trying to learn their way through it, and that's been one of our um, biggest challenging uh, challenges. Since we have to be remote, it's hard to walk someone the first time through on the phone as opposed to being able to share a screen like we're doing today. 
And then information technology's biggest challenge is still having the mainframe. <clears throat> Excuse me. With the mainframe, I have three people that do have to report to work. They are spaced out, so they are generally not there at the same time. And when they are there at the same time, they're not in the same space. So they're only um, at most two people in the information technology department at any one time. And that's because we do have to babysit the mainframe. And that's really uh, ineffective staffing at a time like this because the mainframe has to be maintained on site. Next. Our ongoing plan is to continue to maintain our business continuity. We're following the IT plan that we've had on file with the city manager. And he requested that we actually implement it March 12th, which was, I believe, two weeks before the other departments were asked to um, implement their different uh, plans. What we're working on include the court system, so we're actively working on that. The Intergov Finance, uh, Premier One, which is the Public Safety CAD, the Computer Assisted Dispatch, I believe that's the right acronym, but it's where they uh, do the calls out to the cars for public safety. Um, and we're working with HR for electronic forms, among other things. So all of our active projects are active, and we haven't slowed down on any of those. Information technology is also maintaining our business continuity on all our production applications, and those include things like the tax commissioner and tax assessor IS world, which we uh, have that's web-based. It's not in the cloud, but it is web-based the Columbus Police Department RMS, the HR uh, onboarding, and other things with their NeoGov projects. Um, Finance HR Payroll at Vantage 360 is a cloud-based system, so we are actively maintaining that um, so that people get paid, so that bills get paid, and so that uh, HR can maintain the hiring functions. We're in also maintaining the online uh, Intergov, which is planning, engineering, and inspections is using, and you may see that there are more and more forms going online to make it easier for the citizen to get in touch with those uh, departments. And we're currently maintaining the court system, which is on the mainframe. So basically, we've uh, had a plan in place. The city manager asked me to implement it March 12th in everything that was active before March 12th is still active. So right now, all of our business continuity is good, and we hope to continue that. Next. So any questions? Any questions of IT? They're doing an awesome job working with CCGTV, Mike King, and um, uh, just uh, awesome work by those two areas. Yeah, this uh, is uh, Councilor Huff. Uh, Director Toler just wanted to publicly say thank you. I appreciate you. I'm sure we could never have imagined five years ago when you were talking to us that we'd be in this predicament now. And we did listen, and by the guidance of uh, city manager and other staffers and mayors and everybody, uh, we're here today. So um, for me, uh, something I always thought about as I traveled to conventions and things, I always had to rush back to meetings and things. So hopefully moving forward, for those of us that may be out of town, maybe we can roll into a hotel room and hook up our computer and participate in council meeting and vote. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, if there are no other questions, we're going to... Charmaine. Okay. Um... Thank you very much for what you're doing, um, Tal. This is, um, I, I just see how we could implement this in a lot of different ways. I know one of the concerns we had with the government center um, project was logistically how were we going, how could we keep the government center in its current location without moving all of the employees around and finding a location for them. I think this may have addressed that, that logistical nightmare. 
And so it may open more options for us in our decisions that we're making with the government center project and in a multitude of other decisions that we're going to make in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. And um, Councilor Huff and Councilor Crabb, those are excellent points you make. Uh, uh, since we've been uh, dealing with COVID-19, I can tell you uh, I've had um, um, all of my staff meetings with every single department head um, uh, online, just like what we're doing today. And I can see them, they can see me, and, and, uh, and there was no difference in our meeting other than we were just not there in person. Uh, but um, I, I've had people who I was scheduled to meet with from out of town uh, we sent them an invitation uh, under Microsoft Teams, and I'm meeting with them and looking at them just like I'm looking at you today. Uh, when four or five weeks ago, that person would have driven from uh, North Georgia all the way to Columbus for a one-hour meeting with me. And uh, we just did not use this technology that was available. And when this happened the other day, I'm, I was saying to myself, you know, this guy would have driven all the way to Columbus to meet with me for less than an hour, and yet we did it face to face uh, and uh, didn't miss a beat. And so it's um, we're realizing we're using technology that has always been there for us, but we just never pulled the trigger to use it. And um, uh, so uh, it's 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 opened some doors for me and uh, for us uh, that I, I think are are really awesome. And will be awesome going forward. And and I have to ask myself now, even when we've got staff who's going to go to Atlanta for a meeting, we send them a Microsoft Teams in, team invite. They don't need to drive to Atlanta and and go up there for a one hour meeting. Why don't we just do it the way we're doing it right now? Uh, and so I think it's going to we're going to look at how we do business, why we travel when we travel, when we can do it the easy way. Yeah, it, it's got, it has my mind just rolling about the possibilities, the opportunities. And so, Council Huff, when you pointed that out and Council Crab, uh, you know, I've been thinking about that. I want you to know. And Mr. Manager, yeah, it'll, I also it'll save a lot of time. I also think that um, some of our departments, like the planning department and inspections and codes, can do things online that we were requiring people to come into the building to do and let, let's continue that and expand it and we've got some terrific minds working for the city of columbus and we ought to be able to do do this all the time well i absolutely agree i have a meeting with certain staff every friday morning at 8 30. well we've been meeting just like we're meeting now and so i ask myself why do i have those people driving to the government center to meet with me on Friday morning at 8.30. It makes, I mean, when I think about what how we've been doing it the last few weeks, I said to myself, it makes no sense. I can still look at them and we're just not sitting in the same room. And so I've been wondering or saying to myself, I don't need to have them come to my office in the government center using the elevator, rushing to get in by 8.30 on Friday morning. And Dr. Toll, I think one of the things you might that might be an outcome of this is that um, people see how it is possible to do these things. And so they may be coming to IT saying, okay, if we can do this, why can't we do this? You know, and expand it into, um, into other areas. So our IT department may be, uh, find itself quite busy. Yeah. Yeah. We're hoping that that happens. As a matter of fact, we, we are anticipating that, and it's a good opportunity for us to show the technology that we have. Yeah, we've made an investment. We should use it. Any other questions of Dr. Tolley? If not, we will move on to our next subject. And, um, you know, as we go through COVID-19, uh, I've really wanted our HR department to be engaged. When you look outside of the city government, uh, anything that's going on at major companies like Aflac, Tesis, uh, Synovus, or anywhere else, um, 
things flow through the HR departments. And so I said to our HR director, um, we need to have uh, ongoing communication with our employees uh, about COVID-19 and what we're doing and best practices and what's coming down from uh, CDC or what's coming down from the Department of Health. Um, what are the, the best practices uh, that they uh, suggest uh, if someone comes in contact with a positive or if they're in direct contact? indirect contact with the pot what are the rules what do we play by and we should be communicating that to our employees day after day after day and providing them helpful hints and information and so i wanted her to kind of share with you uh what she has been doing our hr director rita hollowell okay uh mayor and council and mr city manager uh so I wanted to provide just an overview, a list of some of the things that we are doing uh, in human resources and with the city of Columbus to uh, communicate to our employees and to provide uh, information updates on a regular basis as it relates to this uh, current pandemic uh, crisis. So I'll go through just a list of some of the things that we are doing to uh, shore up communication and information updates to our employees. First, I'll start with the uh, COVID-19 exposure protocol. Uh, Human Resources has, we've emailed department directors guidelines on how to address any suspected COVID-19 exposure in their area that might involve their employees and or citizens. Uh, we are complying with any uh, quarantine that may be required as well. We communicate with departments on a case-by-case -case basis when there are specific concerns. Uh, the mayor and city manager, they are updated on any incidents. And uh, we follow the guidelines that have been outlined by the CDC and the Department of Public Health. We are in regular contact with the Department of Public Health and with our city uh, director of Homeland Security. This, these information, and updates are being shared daily. As relates to COVID-19 uh, communication, uh, we provide updates to employees and department directors, including elected officials, at least twice a week more if we have more information to report. Uh, the resources are posted on our city's website, as I'm sure you've seen that uh, also on the uh, HR webpage, this information is updated as changes do occur. Uh, everyone is encouraged, employees and citizens are encouraged to visit our website on a regular basis to see any updates that we placed out there. Uh, the city manager uh, signed a pandemic outbreak or similar illness policy on March the 20th. Uh, the purpose of this policy is to protect employees by providing a safe and healthy work environment for them during any type of uh, flu pandemic or similar illness, which we're experiencing right now. As it relates to uh, sanitizing in high traffic areas, uh, to keep employees safe and comfortable in their work areas, high traffic areas are cleaned daily sometimes twice a day uh, to combat exposure to employees as well as the public. Uh, the city has contracted with a professional cleaning service that meets EPA guidelines for cleaning and sanitizing when there are areas that need uh, special sanitizing and cleaning. Uh, departments are provided additional uh, cleaning and sanitizing supplies, including gloves, hand sanitizer, sanitizing wipes uh, that to help them keep their areas clean. Uh, as relates to our employee assistance program, I wanted to mention that uh, while we are continuing to comply with the governor's and Mayor Henderson's shelter in place order, uh, employees still will be able to uh, receive virtual telehealth uh, counseling services. Uh, the current pandemic crisis highlights the need for mental health counseling, and we wanted to ensure that our employees are 
able to continue to be able to access that and they are able to do that virtually now and we're utilizing our current contracted provider in order to provide that service and that's also posted on our website for employees to receive that information. Um, as it relates to health care, um, employees and dependents uh, that are on the city's health care plan uh, who are tested for COVID-19 the cost of that testing is waived and there's no cost to employees or their dependents. With regard to filing unemployment claims, um, the City of Columbus is filing partial unemployment claims on behalf of those employees who are not working or who are in a no pay status at this time. Uh, this is a directive from the Georgia Department of Labor and it became effective on March the 16th. So employees have begun to receive those unemployment checks in the mail as we speak and we verify that they are receiving their unemployment checks. The final update I wanted to share with you uh, is another federal uh, directive that has been passed. It's called the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, known as the FFCRA. Uh, this particular act was passed on March the 18th and it became effective on April the 1st. Um, the two primary uh, employment provisions that related to this act, it allows for the expansion of the Family and uh, Medical Leave Act as and it's, the other provision is the emergency paid sick leave. Uh, so this information has been shared with employees and department directors. It's also posted again on our website. So this is a benefit, another benefit to help employees, those employees that are eligible during this pandemic crisis who need uh, assistance, additional assistance. Uh, so these are just some of the things uh, that we are doing uh, to number one, keep employees informed and updated about the pandemic uh, crisis and to make sure that we're providing those benefits, whether they're from the federal government, the state government, or locally that we are able to provide to uh, ensure employees uh, that they are able to sustain themselves and that we are providing the, the best work environment that we can possibly provide to employees during this uh, difficult time. That's all I have, Mr. City Manager. Uh, Director Hollowell, this is uh, Councilor Huff. Uh, just two questions. Uh, are employees able to uh, attend to go into the clinic for testing, COVID testing? Employees are able to continue to utilize the Health and Wellness Center uh, for all their primary care needs, acute care, and chronic care needs that they've used in the past. They have as a result of this pandemic crisis, they've in instituted some other avenues. Typically, you're going to be triaged. Uh, you would call the Health and Wellness Center. They will triage you to ensure that, number one, they may be able to take care of your issue on the phone. Or if you need to come in, then they will allow you to come in. As to whether they will um, provide COVID-19 testing, the answer to that is no. However, if you are experiencing COVID-19 symptoms, they will make a referral to you to the Columbus Health Department. Okay, and my second question is for those that are experiencing uh, mental health type issues, will they be referred on at that particular time or will they have someone called in? Well, yes, now that's another contact we our vendor for our uh, pastoral institute our emergent our employee assistance program that's a triage also they would call a designated number there are several numbers that they are able to call to speak with a counselor and they are triaged these are virtual visits typically with mental health counseling they they are excuse me they are virtual visits they would not be seen in person Obviously, if there's a referral needed, uh, they would make that referral. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. This is Council House Director Hollowell. I have a question. If I understood uh, correctly, you said you're helping employees that might need to file for unemployment benefits. Have we? How many people have we had to 
furlough because of this, if anyone? Um, in terms of how many people that we are filing unemployment claims for, I don't have a exact number there, Councilor House, but I can get a number in terms of the number of employees that we have filed unemployment claims for. And I will say for the most part, these are part-time employees. Yes, some of them are full-time employees. And I would not use Councilor Huss the term furlough. These okay. are employees are in a no work status temporarily. So okay. there's not been a form formal furloughing of employees at this time. Okay. Thank you. Rita Pop Barn to you. Hello? Yes, Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Risa, um, I'm, I didn't know anything about this, and I'm really glad, happy, really, to um, see that we are uh, really engaging in something like this um, for our employees. And just to follow up, uh, because I do realize how time-sensitive it is for a lot of these individuals who have been good employees, um, uh, paying bills, uh, roof over their head. Um, is there any way that we can contact the um Department of Labor and find out which ones, because I do realize it's a delay. There's always a delay. I've been there and done that so many times in my life that I know that things happen. Is there any way that we can uh, um, follow up and make sure that um, whatever is needed to be done for these employees is followed through in a timely manner so that there won't be no significant delay for these individuals? This is the, We're really in uncharted waters right now. And, um, and, and I think that we're going to be in this particular situation for an extensive period of time. That's just my, my thinking. And so something like this is really important for those individuals who have families, keeping a roof over their head. And I just want to say thank you to you, to the government, city manager, the mayor, everyone, for being on this particular topic. Because you educated me one on this year, and I appreciate it. So if there's any way that we can make sure that I know there are delays in each and everything. We all have experienced that, that whatever can be done on our part to, um, to ensure that these employees are receiving their compensation or whatever they're supposed to receive in an expeditious manner, I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll just reiterate this uh, director from the Georgia Department of Labor became effective on March 16th. And uh, we immediately began working with departments to uh, secure the names of those employees who have been placed in a no work status due to COVID-19. And we have filed those unemployment claims. We have to file them weekly, and that's what we're doing. We file them every week. This will go for uh, up to 120 days uh, of filing these claims for employees. And as I mentioned also, we know that employees have uh, already begun to receive their unemployment check. So we'll continue this process as uh, mandated by the Department of Labor through that 120 days. And of course, if it's extended, we'll be guided by that directive as well. Awesome, awesome. Kudos to you um, for being on that route. That, that, that is a, a warm fuzzy that I know all of us share. And thank you so much for your pro act for your pro action in this in this uh, situation. Yes, sir. Any other questions of our HR director? If not, I want to thank our HR director. In fact, uh, I'd like uh, Mr. Mayor to take this opportunity to thank you for your leadership um, and uh, thank you for recognizing the work of. Uh, our team, um, because they've worked as a team uh, to make sure that this government uh, has been able to stay functional, uh, operational. Uh, it's an awesome team, and that goes from the department heads to the elected officials and to those working on the front line uh, where they come face to face with uh, citizens like in inspections and codes and engineering and on the, uh, the, the bus drivers. Uh, those driving our garbage trucks, uh, obviously our public safety people, all of them. Uh, but uh, thank you for um, uh, their co your commitment to them, uh, for your commitment 
uh, and uh, for just hanging in there and making sure that we take care of the needs of the citizens. And uh, I, I'll, I'll tell the council members on my team, I did a, a group text to show you how responsive they are. Uh, I did a group text uh, one uh, morning uh, last week at 4 a.m. And within seconds uh, to that text, every one of them were responding back to me at 4 a.m. And then when I talked to them later in the morning, they told me that uh, to just know that they're not always up at 4 a.m. So don't get uh, carried away with uh, texting them at 4 o'clock in the morning. But uh, that's how responsive they are and how committed they are. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you. And to the citizens, uh, we are open for business. Uh, we uh, will continue to provide the essential services that you expect uh, through the modified or non-traditional ways. Uh, we are going to comply with the executive order, uh, orders of the governor and the mayor. And uh, we look forward to continuing to serve you uh, as we go through this unprecedented event. So, Mr. Mayor, with that, that concludes my agenda. Mr. City Mr. Manager, Mr. Mrs. Pops here. I want to say for you to be up at 4 a.m. with city business on your mind, that shows how committed you are. And we're giving out all these warm fuzzies to all the department heads and everyone, and that's the good thing. We want to give you a warm and fuzzy. Being up at 4 a.m., you may think you're in the Army, Mr. City Manager. <laughs> <laughs> but that goes to show well, you that you, amount of hurry that you have for our community. Well, thank you, sir. The city manager, before you close, could you uh, could you highlight, and thank you for everything, too. really appreciate that. Citizens appreciate it. But could you highlight the, uh, uh, the uh, emergency, I guess, storm, the storm uh, debris pickup, and also the reinstatement of uh, yard waste and debris pickup? Um, yes, sir. We had a uh, number of uh, calls um, through 911 and into 311 about um, uh, yard debris. In fact, uh, Deputy City Manager Goodwin, are you still on? If you will, I'm going to I'm going to defer that to you and let you respond to that. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, we did have on uh, Sunday eve Sunday night, um, early morning, widespread minimal damage throughout the community um, of um, debris, limbs, and such. As a result, um, for the next two weeks, we will be deploying grab balls in, uh, throughout the city to pick up limbs and brush as a result of the storm. Uh, that will go through April the 24th. So, again, through April the 24th, for the next two weeks, grab balls will come throughout the community to pick up uh, limbs and brush that you put out on the right of way. Uh, then on Monday, April the 27th, that's when we will go ahead and reinstate um, picking up um, just residential yard waste. So anything that you have out there from grass clippings to limbs, brush, those kinds of things, normal stuff outside of the storm stuff, uh, we will be picking that up on the regularly scheduled day. That does, of course, include we're continuing to pick up household garbage uh, on the regularly scheduled day. But again, yard waste will resume Monday, April the 27th. Uh, and through April the 24th, for the next two weeks, we will ask you to go ahead and pick, put out on the, on the curb, on the right-of-way, any limbs or debris uh, as a result of this past weekend's storm damage. Yes, sir, and thank you, thank you, Deputy City Manager Good One. One more thing, too, would you, uh, I'm still getting calls about the recycling. Could you maybe touch on that and explain that, why the city is taking that position and, and, uh, at this time and not taking the recycling of uh, sure. waste and materials that, uh, that we normally do? Okay. The main reason we have shut down the recycling is because they're at the recycling center. It takes a number of people. We have, um, uh, you know, uh, 40 to 50 people in the recycling center to include employees and inmates um, that are there managing those recycling efforts. And because of social distancing and all the efforts 
um, uh, as required by CDC, we've had to disband that so that our employees are not at risk. So that's why we have um, postponed the pickup and the collection of recycling materials. Uh, again, at this point, recycling materials, you know, uh, you can do it still a number of different ways. Uh, you can combine your recycling with your household trash. It will be picked up. You can hold on to your recycling uh, until we get it uh, reinstated after all of this is over. Or, of course, you can then take it to um, the, the landfill to be disposed of. And, of course, we are waiving uh, any of those tipping fees for um, our residents that are going through there. All they need is proper identification. By going through there, there will not be a cost to them. So they can bring their yard waste to Granite Bluff and to Pine Grove Landfill, um, and the tipping fees, again, will be waived with proper identification. And that's all that we ask, And but that's the reason recycling uh, has been postponed, just for the protection of our, our employees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Any additional questions? Hearing none, um, Mr. City Manager. Um, if uh, no pending, with no further questions, Mr. Mayor, that concludes my agenda. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you may be on mute. Um, my my like favorite button, by the way, when I'm talking is my mute button. So. <laughs> No, I apologize. Yes. I apologize for the change in scenery. My battery was dying and I didn't have a cord, so I had to move the, the laptop. But I was just saying thank you for the updates. I think it's critical not only for council, but for um, for the citizens to be able to understand what great lengths the uh, the government is going to to try to make sure we continue to provide services. And, and the folks that help the folks, so to speak, all of our employees are just absolutely incredible. And we appreciate everything they're doing. Uh, Madam Clerk, to your agenda. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Council for the clerk's agenda. Item number one is a resolution approving an application submitted by the Georgia Alabama Senior Softball League requesting an honorary designation to name a field at the South Common Softball Complex in honor of Mr. Nimrod Kendrick. Move for approval. The has Hunt. recommended approval. Second. All right, there's a motion by Councilor Huff, second by Councilor Woodson. Any discussion? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Is there any member of council that does not approve the resolution? All right, that passes unanimously. Item two, minutes of various boards to be received. We will see. Second. second. Motion and a second to receive the minutes. Who made the second? Uh, I did. Okay. All right. Uh, any sorry, any Mr. discussion? Mayor, can we go over who made who made the motion? I'm sorry. Who made the motion? House. Councilor House. Second by Woodson. And seconded by <laughs> Councilor Woodson. Thank you. We're fighting over it. <laughs> Sounds like they're all in favor. So all in favor of the being received. Pushed around. <laughs> I uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Is there anybody who objects to the minutes being received? Uh, they are uh, unanimously. Thank you. And lastly, Mr. Mayor, we have upcoming board appointments, Board of Family and Children's Services, Columbus Aquatics Commission, Columbus Golf Course Authority, Keep Columbus Beautiful Commission, the New Horizon Behavior Health, Mental Health, Addictive Diseases and Developmental Disabilities, Community Service Board, Pension Fund, Employees Board of Trustees, Region, Region. 6, Regional Advisory Council for Department of Behavior Health and Developmental Disabilities, and the Retirees <laughs> Health Benefits Committee. And that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilor right. Huff here. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, would like to renominate Richard Mahone for the Golf Authority. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, we will have that listed for the Thank next you. meeting. And, and Sandra, I'd like to nominate uh, um, 
Dr. Bussey for the um, Columbus Aquatics. We have no senior representation on that board. Dr. Bussey was on originally, and so I'd like to nominate her for that seat. Thank you, Councilor Barnes. I have that noted, and we will have that listed as well for the next meeting. Madam Clerk. Thank you so much, Sandra. <clears throat> You're welcome. Madam Clerk, this is Charmaine. Did you get the application for, from Tommy Nobles for the Golf Course Authority? Has that been a recent application or? Um, I would say within the last two to three weeks. Okay. I don't recall, Councilor Crabb, but I will double check that and uh, get back with you regarding that. <laughs> Okay, because I do want to nominate him, and he said that he went online and filled out the application. Okay, thank you. I, I will check that and make sure. Okay, so I did want to nominate him for one of the positions. For one of the positions on the Golf Authority, yes. Okay, we'll, we'll identify that position before the next council meeting, and we'll have that listed. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Crabb. All right, any more business that needs to come before council? I would I would finish and close this today then by urging all of our citizens to continue to do what they need to do to try to keep this virus uh, from spreading and keep our numbers down, flattening the curve so that we don't overwhelm, overwhelm our hospitals. Uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion and a second to adjourn. Council, thank you for your work. Staff, thank you. We are adjourned. Oh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All right. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Right. Have, Have a great day. Bye.